Welcome to episode 19 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. In this episode, we're talking with Matt Davis from Hoyt Archery. We discuss what you should look for when selecting your next bow, whether that's from Hoyt or from somebody else. We dive into aspects of bows that you often see on paper, such as brace height and axle to axle length and speed, but we talk about what those things really mean and how they should affect your bow selection and purchasing. We also talk about cam design and the draw cycle and the volley and the wall and all those aspects to help you become a more informed bow customer. So, if you're shopping for a bow soon or maybe down the road, hope you'll really enjoy this episode. But before we get to that episode, let me remind you about two giveaways we have going on. And this is the last reminder because both giveaways are ending in just a few days here. So first up, if you join Backcountry Hunters and Anglers or renew your membership to Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and send us proof of that to podcast at exomountaingear.com, you will be entered to win a $50 gift card from Rob and Steve at SNS Archery. Also, Exo Mountain Gear, you're giving away a pack system of your choice. To get all the details, go to exomountaingear.com forward slash giveaway. There you'll see how you can enter including a special bonus entry method just for you podcast listeners. In this show, the final bonus keyword that you want to enter is no boundaries. At Exo Mountain Gear, we want you to hunt farther, hunt longer, and have no boundaries in how you chase the game that you want to seek. So this week's keyword, no boundaries. Go there, enter, be sure you do that soon. We only have a few days left. We are drawing that winner on Christmas. All right, on to the show. The Hunt Back Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra tough packs that are designed to do what you love most hunt the backcountry. Exo packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. Well, Matt, welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. How are you doing? Doing good, Mark. How, how about you, man? Very good. Steve, how about yourself? Fantastic. It's uh, what? It's almost Christmas time, another crazy. two weeks or something. It's just, yeah. crazy. holy cow. You know, crazy. we'll be seeing Matt here at ATA show in yeah. three, four weeks, whatever that is. It's, it's uh, yeah. time, time flies. It's going to be a good time season. for sure. So Matt, you are with Hoyt. Kind of what's the, what do you, well, first off, what do you do with Hoyt? What's your position? What's your uh, responsibilities look like there? Yeah. So, um, my title here at Hoyt is our pro staff manager, and what I do is I work with both our hunting and target staff, um, also help a little bit on the PR side, um, a couple of the publications and stuff like that. But my main responsibility is obviously, you know, the point of contact for all of our shooters. You know, I help take care of them as far as, you know, making sure that their orders get out to them, gathering feedback for our engineers, a plethora of things and we've got a pretty extensive staff so they they definitely keep me busy (laughs) yeah yeah Hoyt does for sure have a large staff yeah so before we dive into bows now that you brought that up I'm kind of curious what are some of the um, recommendations for guys who are kind of interested in getting involved in that side of things I mean I I know I've been on the pro staff with Elite for a handful of years now recently, so I've seen behind the scenes what it's really about. And I think it's a pro staff position is obviously a lot different than I think what maybe the internet people think it is. So could you just kind of talk about that, um, what a pro staff position is, and then what a good pro staffer uh, does? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So most of the time people are trying to figure out if pro staff means professional hunter or promotional staff and realistically the way I look at it is 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 promotional staff in a sense obviously you know the people that are on our staff are very established and successful hunters and target archers but realistically you know the bottom line of any marketing strategy budget whatever you're putting into that is is to sell bows right I mean that's selling hunting bows is what keeps the lights on here at Hoyt. And so that's kind of what we aim to do. And obviously they have to go out and and promote us. And so some of the things that, you know, I look for is, is first and foremost, you know, 
are they approachable? Are they nice? I mean, there, there's some people that are out there that have killed piles of giant mule deer and elk and whatever it is, but they're one, they're kind of cocky about it. And for me personally, maybe that's not getting off to the right start, but, um, you know, it's, it's being able to be approachable and recommend products and have a good influence in your area. Pro staff doesn't mean you're just a professional hunter. It, it's all about your reach and some of the things you do, whether it's through, you know, social media, YouTube, whatever that is. It's if you've established yourself and people actually kind of, in a sense, care about what you have to say, that brings value to you. So if I'm going to make an investment in you, whether it's providing equipment or whatever that is, I expect to see a return on that investment and whether that's, you know, you're potentially switching a couple guys over from another manufacturer to shoot Hoyt bows, you know, kind of, and maybe I'm going into too much depth, but cover my cost in that sense. I, I need to see a return on that and make it, you know, worth my investment. And that's, that's what we look for. And most of our guys, you know, they do that. They go above and beyond and people want to be successful. And the Hoyt pro staff title is something that's very prestigious um, not everybody gets that. I get hundreds upon hundreds of emails almost every day of people that want to be on staff, whether they're sending me links to their to their videos or their social media outlets and, and whatever that is. So there's there's definitely a desire for people to want to come out and do that. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about marketing reach. If, if that's not there and you don't have a kind face, you know, usually doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't imagine getting hundreds and hundreds of emails. I think we probably get a dozen or so a week for EXO. And it's, it, it's hard to weed through that because you just you don't know who's looking for something for free and and who legitimately wants to use your use and promote your product. Yeah, oh, and that's that's so true. And it's you know, you guys probably maybe have heard of this, but we call it the archer's handshake. And basically, it's someone just holding their hand out. <laughs> you know, Feed everybody. Me. You know, there's all these different teams and this and that, and they're trying to, you know, whatever it is. And that's all awesome because that's that's what's growing the sport of archery. And we definitely, we support archery as a company. But people think they've made it when they get a free bow. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you'll, get a, you'll get a guy that'll hit you up and he's, you know, getting free broadheads and a dozen free arrows and, and a trail camera or whatever. And but that that's it's it's not about what sponsors you have it's 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 your reach it's the power of the reach and if people like you if you're on there you're reaching a bunch of people but it doesn't fit you know our marketing sense you know i i don't want guys out there that are dropping f bombs and putting up pictures of stupid things and interjecting their personal life you know in a way that they shouldn't into you know the professional side of things you know that's Mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing I do when someone sends me an email is I look at their Facebook. <laughs> That's the very first thing I do because <laughs> I want to. I want to see a face. I want to know who I'm talking to, mm -hmm. and I'll start sc scrolling through their news feed. And if they're a party animal or just kind of a ditz in a sense i mean I, that's not someone i'm really interested in talking to and i and i and it's nothing personal. It's nothing. I, I don't have anything against that. But the business side of me kind of it throws up a red flag, and, and I'm mm -hmm. not interested in pursuing that. So. Yeah, I think that's one thing. One big mindset shift is sometimes when people are pursuing something like a pro staff position, they think, oh, if I get in with Hoyt, well, then Hoyt's going to represent me. And it, it, it's they go into it with it being about them versus it being about, oh, well, no, you're really a representative of Hoyt. So things like exactly. those, you know, not being professional and, you know, those aspects are huge, obviously, to a company because to the company, you are now representing that brand exactly and it, it, it's so funny i mean you get people and we, i mean we get thousands of facebook messages a day and stuff like that and there's people that are like isn't so and so on your on your staff or whatever and look at this picture of him doing this like people if they see one of our staff members they don't i'll, I'll use michael waddell for example michael's never done anything wrong but i'm just using his name because everybody knows who he is you know, if, if he was to go and do something, it just it wouldn't just be Michael Waddell. It'd be the bone collectors and Hoyt. They wouldn't mm -hmm. hate Michael. They'd hate the bone collectors and they'd hate Hoyt. And they'd be mad at us because we're supporting him. Yeah. It's funny how people are about that. So it's, you know, if there's people going out and doing that stuff, it doesn't matter what kind of bow hunter you are. I'm, I'm not interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Cool. Well, let's uh, let's transition to start talking about uh, bows and really. Uh, the goal for this episode is to kind of have a roundtable discussion about uh, bow selection. Certainly, we'll talk about the Hoyt lineup along the way and what Hoyt has to offer, what's new for 2016. But, you know, I think it's interesting, I guess, tying this into the pro staff conversation with the shows and events that I've done um, as a pro staff member. It's interesting. One of the questions I get probably most frequently if we're at a show and we're demoing some bows and, you know, guys walk up is, what's the fastest bow you have? And so, you know, I think it's an interesting yeah. place to start, but it's the place where I think most people do start. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Do you think that speed should be one of the primary or the primary factors in bow selection? Absolutely not. I, I don't know if you know about me personally and how I hunt and stuff, Mark, but, but I shoot a recurve. Obviously I play with compounds all day and I shoot them, but I hunt and mainly shoot a recurve bow, and my bow shoots like 182 feet per second, shooting about a 550 grain arrow. Yeah. And Do you shot- ever have a deer catch the arrow and throw it back at you because they saw it coming? <laughs> not, not yet. Usually, it just goes right through their ribs and they fall over dead pretty quick. So <laughs> definitely, uh, speed is not the should never be the the deciding factor. And, and choosing a bow that's my two cents and there's guys out there you know sometimes there's guys with a with a shorter draw length and you know if they're going on a specific hunt and they're trying to bump up their kinetic energy you know that's in a sense yeah i guess i could i could see that side of things but and and we'll obviously hop into the hoyt line in a sense but you know that's one of the things we pride ourselves on is the overall shooter experience and the extensive line that we offer i mean realistically if you're wanting to get the best of the best you know it doesn't matter what size you are man woman poundage color you name it we're going to have something that covers that and it's going to be the best of the best so yeah so you mentioned kind of a little bit that you know speed can help in some areas um, obviously boosting kinetic energy may be helpful for a guy with a shorter draw length just so he can get you know speed he can make up for with his draw length are there any other advantages to sort of chasing a higher speed that you can think of off the bat off the top of my head realistically no i mean the more and i'll let steve hop in i know he ran a shot for a while he's he's a super tuner squared kind of deal and obviously i'm I'm voicing my opinion about this but steve feel free to to chime in you know a a faster bow in a sense you know it's got more energy xyz and and they can be more difficult to tune if you have a forgiving bow that's smooth that's shooting a good speed and overall you know it's not some wild machine and i'm not saying that there's any bow out there particularly like that but i i really don't see any other benefits to speed because it's in my opinion it's all about a sharp broadhead and a heavy arrow it doesn't matter what it is i mean i know people that have shot through elk with a 40 pound compound you know shooting a 300 and something grain arrow so in in my opinion no but i don't know steve what are your thoughts um yeah i mean to to me when i really got into tuning and i was building kind of custom bows there for a while um i was all about getting as much speed as i could kind of got caught up in that race and then as you hinted there tuning becomes so much more finicky especially with like a fixed blade broadhead um that the it, it really it starts adding up to over the years. I just got to the point where I want the most forgiving, accurate bow I can. Yep. And up to that, I, I want as much speed as I can get out of it. Uh, and my only argument would be a little bit higher kinetic energy and to just forgiving of yardage. And, and it isn't, yep. you know, it's not that big of a difference, but maybe you got to make a guess at an elk that's at 40 uh, and he's actually 44 and you're probably just going to clip the heart. Now, if you were shooting slower, you maybe shoot underneath them. Um, but but that's really it. I think speed should be the last on your priority list um, with the caveat of being I want to get as much as possible, but I don't want to forgive it, give up a smooth draw, a solid back wall, um, you know, and, and create tuning issues at the same time. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And it's, you know, there's a saying it's not about how fast you can miss them, right? So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so any shooter out there, if you have a bow, you know, it, it's your responsibility to know your own personal limitations and, and the limitations of the equipment. You know, if it's, if it's whether, like Steve said, it's a 40 or a 45 yard shot, you should probably have a pretty good idea of where you kind of need to hold in a sense. And obviously, you know, right. people get in hunting situations and there's a gazillion 
variables that play into that. But yeah. like you said, I, I echo and, and agree 100% with that. That speed should be the last um, deciding factor when picking a bow. Yeah. Cool. So on the related topic of speed, um, I guess just to dive into bow anatomy, if you will, one yeah. of the big differences, um, one of the ways that bow manufacturers pick up speed on a bow is to change the brace height of a bow. So before we dive into that conversation, um, real quick, Matt, do you want to kind of explain uh, what brace height is for those who are uh, maybe learning a bit more about bows? Yeah, basically all that is is a simple measurement between the throw to the grip of the bow where your hand's going and, and in the back of the string there. And um, brace height, obviously, you know, the shorter that is, if you think about it in very simple ter terms, um, the smaller that distance is, depending on what your draw length is, obviously it's increasing the power stroke. So when you see a bow that has a shorter brace height, it's going to shoot faster simply because that arrow is on the string longer during that shot sequence, which obviously allows for higher energy transfer into that arrow and picks up on that. So usually, I mean, you can see some bows out there and I'm not going to name manufacturers, but they have, you know, five inch brace heights and stuff like that. And, <laughs> and anyways, it's just trying to compensate for, for the design of the bow in a sense. And there's people out there that want to get that speed, but yeah, brace height is just a simple measurement between that, the throw of the grip and the string. So, yeah. So when we talk about, um, brace heights and like the difference between a six inch and a seven inch. And you mentioned it's, you know, from the throat of the grip back to the string. So say for example, 30 inch draw, if you have a seven inch brace height bow to oversimplify this, you're actually going to be pulling that bow back, um, 23 inches. So draw length minus brace heights, the difference would be 23. Whereas if you had a six inch brace height, you'd add an extra inch to the draw cycle, as you mentioned, increasing the power stroke, therefore giving you more speed and power. Yep, yep, exactly. And, okay. and most speed bows, you'll, I mean, on a, on brace height and stuff like that, a lot of speed bows per se, usually they'll combine that short brace height with with a cam, with a with a turbo design or something like that. But yeah, definitely, that's that's exactly how you would look at it. Yeah. So I guess to take an example out of the Hoyt playbook, if you will, uh, new for 2016 would be the Carbon Defiant, and then you have the Carbon Defiant Turbo. So the Carbon Defiant would be a 7-inch brace height bow, right? Yep, that's right. And that's probably pretty much, I don't want to say the standard, but probably the the most common brace height used these days would be 7 inches. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 7 inches is pretty standard. Yeah. And then the six inch, the carbon defiant turbo has a six inch brace height then, and also a different cam design. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Kind of like I hinted at earlier, it does have its own, um, it's the DFX turbo cam, which is obviously got a different, different shape to that cam in a sense. People would almost see it. They call them like kind of vector cams in a sense, but yep, yeah. it's got a different cam. So with those two changes and we can dive into the cam discussion and, and draw cycles a little bit later here, but with those two differences, for example, between the carbon defiant and then the turbo version, what kind of speed gains are you making when you go to that turbo version? Yep. So we, we measure our speed at ATA rating, not IBO, which is what AD basically everybody else uses <laughs> not, not to knock on them, but that's, you know, 70 pounds, 30 inches of draw length, 350 grain arrow and a carbon defiant is shooting 331 feet per second okay so okay. certainly not slow by any means no and that's... then that i mean and back to that that whole speed discussion you know speed should never be the the ultimate deciding factor but most bows nowadays are shooting over 300 feet per second you know depending on what they're rated at i guess but they're they're shooting plenty fast so um, and then the Defiant Turbo with the six inch brace height and the Turbo Cam is shooting 350 feet per second. And again, that's 70 pounds, 30 inches of draw length, and a 350 grain arrow. Okay. So, so gaining almost 20 almost, feet. Almost 20 feet per second. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned as well the difference between ATA and IBO and how those speeds are rated, just so um, people can know whether you know they're looking apples to apples when they're looking at speed ratings. Can you kind of comment on the difference? As you mentioned, pretty much everybody in the industry uses IBO. Um, you guys use ATA. What's the difference in those ratings? 
so ATA is it, it, it's a set standard. It's it's 70, 30, 350 grains. Um, there's some variances that can play into the IBO. There's you know plus and minus on weight and draw length and overall arrow weight. And there's actually a really good uh, article by Evan Williams, who's actually a Hoyt employee here. He actually wrote it before he worked here. That's on Rock Slide, I believe, that kind of addresses that and dives further into that. And I obviously don't have that open on my screen, but I would invite anybody that kind of wants to learn a little bit more about that to check out that article because it's it's pretty interesting to see, you know, you, you look at another manufacturer's catalog and you can see those speeds, but it's, it's IBO. You know, there's guys that are like, well, why isn't this bow shooting 380 feet per second? It's like, well, first off, you've got like a 27 inch draw and you're only shooting 65 pounds and stuff like that. So don't, don't buy into the speed thing more than anything. But yeah, if you want to learn more about that, I'd check out that article. Cause I don't know the exact IBO specifications off the top of my head, but I know it is pretty flexible in, in that sense. Yeah. I think the, the big thing to keep in mind for you guys who are um, looking at bows is, for these speed ratings, as you mentioned, there's sort of standards on the arrow weight, um, the draw length, and then the poundage of the bow at which those speeds are rated. And, you know, there's a great chance and pretty much almost a given that you're not going to be hunting with those specs. You're right. probably not a 30 inch draw length. You might be shooting 70 pounds, but you're most likely going to be shooting a heavier area, uh, a heavier arrow in a hunting scenario. Therefore, you're going to see some slower speeds in the in the real world, if you will. Yep, exactly. That's how you need to approach it. You need to realize what you're using it for and make your decision based off that. Yeah. So again, on this topic of brace height, uh, uh, in addition to speed being a factor, I think for brace height, when guys are sort of bow shopping, you know, one bit of conventional wisdom that's often thrown out there that's probably somewhat debatable is that a higher or a longer brace height is more forgiving. Um, so on one end, guys will say, well, short brace height is fast, a longer brace height is more forgiving. Do you agree with that? And if so, kind of why or why not? Yes and, and no. And Steve, again, feel free to hop in here and bonk me on the head when you think I'm wrong. So... <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's an inch difference, and obviously you get more speed out of it. You know, one of the first turbo models that I shot was Hoyt Spectre Turbo, and the only difference between that bow, it didn't have its own specific cam. It was a 2012 bow. All it was was a shorter brace height. And obviously the longer a arrow is on a string, the longer you need to hold on target, right? So if you're dropping your bow arm you know, that's going to be magnified, you know, it's, if you're coming out the bottom, going out the top, whatever. And I think that's where you lose that, that forgiveness and, and brace height. And obviously, you know, speed tunability and whatnot, if it's not tuning very well for you, that could also play a factor. But in my personal opinion, you know, a difference between seven and six break, seven and six inches of brace height for me, having shot both, um, not really. And some guys, obviously it draws differently. Like you said, you're going to be having to basically cycle the bow a little bit further. And some guys feel that it's stiffer and it has to pull further, but realistically, I don't, I don't think there's that big of a difference. So unless, so if the cam is forgiving and shoots, which most turbo models in a sense aren't because they're designed for speed and speed isn't free. People need to always remember that you're never going to have the same experience shooting a super smooth 34 that you are, you know, shooting a turbo model. But, um, my two cents realistically, no, I think overall axle to axle length and um, the shooting experience as far as comfort is what's going to allow a shooter to, to be, or a bow, excuse me, to be more forgiving. So, I don't know. Steve, thoughts? Um, my, I shot an Elite Judge. I don't know when that was, 2010, 2011. Uh, yeah. It was a six-inch brace height, faster bow, um, and it's it was probably the worst bow I've shot accuracy wise. Um, and what and what I noticed for me was when I was on, I was on. If I was shooting lights out, it didn't matter what bow I was shooting. But on my bad days or on a windy day, you know that at sixty yards, maybe if I would have made a bad shot and say I was going to hit two or three inches left, it seemed to be four or five inches left. Um, yeah. And so that 
I, ever since then, I've, I've never even gone back to a six inch brace height. I, I do shoot a 29 and a half inch draw length. Um, definitely guys need to consider that, that, you know, if, I think if you're that 27 and a half and under a six inch, isn't going to penalize you as much as a, a guy with a longer draw. Um, Absolutely. because what Matt mentioned, the, the, the arrow isn't on the string as long. Um, but, but for me, I, I just like a 33, 34, seven inch brace height. That's like my, my comfort zone. I'm confident in those specs and I, and I shoot well with it. So I usually always look at that, you know, like I, I look at your def- defiant 34, like a 34 inch, seven inch brace height. To me, that's, that's perfect. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a good thing that I forgot to mention. I mean, you can kind of base that off your, your draw length If that arrow's going to be on there for 29 inches or 30 inches. Like, yeah, that seven inches is probably going to be a little more forgiving in that sense that it's going to get rid of quicker. So it's not going to magnify any, you know, shooter air input down range. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, in the end, to summarize that, the longer that that arrow's on the string um, when the shot is released, or when you fire your release, um, the more influence you have is the more time that things can go wrong. And so ultimately, if your draw length is longer and your brace height is shorter on either ends of those spectrums, a longer draw length or a shorter brace height, is more influence that you have on the arrow, which is, you know, a bad thing, I think, for forgiveness and accuracy. Yeah. Yep. Mark, Mark, have you shot a six inch before? I have, um, not extensively. Like you, I've always kind of stayed in my wheelhouse with what I've been comfortable with, which is mm-hmm. you know usually around seven inch um, brace height than that. So, y- yeah, I have, and my experience has kind of been the same as you, Steve. I've, I've shot it where it's been days where I'm like, this is the best thing ever. Um, but then like you said, when things go wrong, I think they go worse. Um, and so, yeah, I would just kind of echo that experience for myself. Um, you know, I think the conventional wisdom, I think there's some truth to it that a longer brace height is more forgiving. I do think that it's maybe not as much of a factor as it used to be. Again, if you think of the, the, really the point here being time on the string for the arrow, since these bows are faster, even a quote unquote non turbo and non speed bow, yeah. since the bows have gotten faster, I think that it's um, reduced the effects of that brace height discussion some. But I still think that there is um, some forgiveness to be gained uh, by a longer brace height for sure. Yeah, and I think there's uh, there's other factors too um, when it comes to brace height that guys don't think about. For example, so you know. If, <laughs> You know, I get guys who are hunting up north who do a ton of whitetail hunting who are, you know, using it late season and or where it's just generally very cold anyway. And small factors like a brace height could mean a difference if you are constantly um, hunting from a tree stand and wearing giant bulky clothing. Yeah. Um, for example, you know, your sleeves, you're wearing a giant parka style clothes, a shorter brace height can interfere with that much more easily than a longer brace height could. And just in general, um, you know, I think there is for some guys a perceived effort with an easier to draw bow that has a longer brace height. So kind of between those two factors, um, that might be, um, something that could influence somebody's purchasing as well, I think. So the biggest factor for me, um, before I look at speed, before I look at brace heights, and you kind of mentioned it, Matt, was the ATA length or the axle to axle length. So again, first to back up for the basic premise of what is um, an ATA length. So that's just a simple measurement between, you know, they call it axle to axle, and the axle is what's holding those cams in. So just a simple measurement from basically the middle of the cam to the middle of the cam or the axle and the limb there. Yeah. So how long is the bow basically or how tall is it? Yeah. So if, if you, I'm interested in both of your opinions, Steve and Matt, and then we'll probably get into a deeper discussion, I'm sure. But in general, what are some of the advantages to a shorter bow? What are some of the advantages to a longer bow? Do you want to start, Steve? <laughs> I feel like um, I'm yeah, yeah I, I think, um, I guess in my opinion, that would be um, just the physics of it, the the longer the axle to axle is when that's in your hand, it's the same effect as a long stabilizer on your bow. The further that weight is away from the pivot point, which is your grip, the harder it is going to be to move that weight. Um, and so a longer axle to axle bow is generally considered more stable than a shorter axle to axle bow. Um, 
And I'd love to get into you, Matt, with your new limbs here that I saw it in your marketing where yeah. I'm assuming your limbs are more preloaded so that as you draw through it, the limbs don't have to flex as much because really a lot of guys don't really look at that as – to me, a long riser again, because most of your weight's going to be in that riser. Um, and then two limbs that don't, as you draw, don't flex too much because what, what's really important is your axle to axle measurement at full draw. Um, so I noticed that in your marketing this year. Um, and I thought it was pretty, pretty awesome just because that is a very important factor to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And, and kind of like I touched touched on earlier it's about the shooter experience like steve said it's it's about having a bow that that's stable to you and and fits you as an archer right you know a guy that has a 30 inch draw length you're not going to see steve shooting a 31 inch axle to axle bow you know that string angle is going to be so severe on him the way it's going to fit him it's not it's, it's not made for him right um but again touching on what steve said you know that effective axle to axle length is a extremely important and that's one of our big marketing strategies and I wish we had a video and, and maybe Mark I can send you a picture I don't know how you post these um. yeah for sure I mean one I'll say right off the bat is if you go to um, you know the page like for the carbon defined for example they do have yeah. the graphics right there additionally yep. we can uh, add this to the show notes so when guys are viewing Sweet. this on the podcast page we can be sure to include those perfect so yeah basically I mean Going into comparison, if if anybody is looking at that picture, they hit pause and want to head over and check it out on Hoyt.com, looking at the Carbon Defiant, um, the effective string angle is basically from the angle of the string as it comes off the bow. And with our new Ultraflex limb system, you know, harnessed up with these DFX cams, it's basically adding more forgiveness as, as far as that string angle. So... You know, for example, a 31 inch, our 31 inch bow is potentially shooting like a 34 inch bow. I know a lot of guys, um, I'll throw his name out there, Matt Bateman. I'll, I'm sure a lot of you guys know who Matt is. Matt and I are great friends. He's over at uh, Grim Reaper, and that guy is a killing machine. Um, he piles up the animals nonstop, and he's, anyways, he's been a big, you know, 34 advocate. That's kind of what he's hunted with he's a big western hunter elk mule deer all that stuff and he's going to shoot the 31 inch bow this year simply because he knows that that bow one is going to basically shoot in a sense like his 34 inch bow because of that effective string angle but a shorter bow is for any whitetail hunters or people that like to hunt out of blinds and stuff like that it's a heck of a lot easier to fit a shorter bow in there than it is you know a bow that's obviously longer. I can speak from personal experience. You know, I hunt turkeys and hogs and bears out of a ground blind using a recurve. And it took me about two months to finally find a blind that was tall enough for me to shoot my recurve in. I mean, my blind's like six and a half feet tall. So for everybody else uh -huh. out there who wants something <laughs> normal and doesn't want to look like they're sitting in a house condo when they're hunting, <laughs> uh, you know, those shorter to axle axle bows do have that benefit. But again, a stable platform, um, is by far the most important. And, and again, it's, it's, it's gotta fit you. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to recap, going back to the point of, I think balance and stability, one, one way that I always like to explain it to people when you see the tightrope walkers, um, and they're trying to balance on something very small, they're mm -hmm. always carrying that very, very long crossbar. Um, yeah. And that helps stabilize them. And so that's obviously a horizontal application. But if you do the same thing in a vertical scenario um, with a bow at full draw, um, the longer that that bow is, um, the more stable it could be, the better I think that you can balance, as you mentioned, uh, Steve, on that pivot point, which is your grip. Mm -hmm. So the more length you have coming out of either end of your grip, um, the more stability that you're going to find at full draw, which certainly for Western hunting, especially where you have factors such as um, you know, longer distance shots, um, wind, things of that nature, that can certainly make a difference. Um, and then as we mentioned, you know, the effective string angle, the, the biggie there for me, which is, you know, I'm just huge on it. That's why it's the thing I look at before speed and before brace height is, um, this ATA length is again, as you mentioned, just comfort. It's just more comfortable for me to shoot. Again, I'm a longer draw 30, 30 and a half inches with a longer bow. 
And I think it also translates to consistency. So when you look at finding um, proper anchor points when you're at full draw, you know, so many guys want to get, um, you know, like a corner of the mouth. Maybe they use a kisser with a string. They want to get their nose down on the string, things of that nature. You know, so many guys are contorting themselves to the bow at full draw to get proper anchor points. Instead of getting a bow, I think that fits them and naturally gives them those proper anchor points. Yeah, it's it, it's all about the shooter experience. It doesn't matter how fast the bow shoots or how cool it looks. If if you're not comfortable and and consistent with your equipment, it doesn't do you one bit of good. I always my saying is consistency kills. Right, that's that's my big saying, especially shooting a recurve. I've got to do the same thing every single time because I'm not shooting a compound. It, it's all me. I'm shooting fingers. I'm shooting a different kind of setup. But to your point, it's if, if you're not comfortable, if your head's not in the right position, if you're crimping your neck or you're chicken winged into a bow on the draw length or whatever that is, those inconsistencies are definitely going to, you know, make the shooting experience not as enjoyable. And if you don't enjoy shooting your bow, then you're probably not enjoying archery. So, and that's not good for any of us. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, I had a I have a really bad shoulder, and I got to the point where you know I was always shooting seventy two pounds, uh, and I I had to drop down to sixty five because I stopped enjoying shooting. Um, and then this this year I switched to shooting sixty five, and I just like I hang out in the backyard now and just shoot all the time. Yeah, uh, and it's fun to enjoy shooting again. Yeah, it must be a thing to get old, Steve. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Third to 31 years old and a bad shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Crotchety old man. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I guess in terms of spec-wise, you know, those are probably the main ones that guys are going to look at is speed, brace height, axle to axle length. But there's certainly other um, design aspects or factors uh, to consider when shopping. I mean, I think one thing, especially from the Hoyt side of the house that you guys have really led the way in is the mass weight of the bow, certainly not the draw weight, but just the mass weight of the bow with your carbon series. So what's sort of the emphasis behind that and behind um, offering the carbon series bows? I know that there's, you know, other advantages beyond just the mass weight of the bow, but if you just kind of want to speak to that side of the things from, from Hoyt. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you look at carbon, whether it's in cycling or race cars or whatever else is out there you know the properties and advantages of carbon are far substantial or far greater than aluminum you know the inside spread of our catalog and again i invite anybody to hop on it and check that out and i'll just bust through a couple of those um carbon is seven times tougher than aluminum um the weight ratio is far greater um, the strength is a lot, obviously stronger. It's 208 times more effective in the thermal insulation for, you know, guys, whether it's whitetail or guys here in Utah hunting the Wasatch Front. You will notice a difference between toting around a carbon bow or an aluminum bow. Any of us that have hunted in that in late season conditions and you grab your aluminum bow, you know what I'm talking about. It's, <laughs> it, it's cold on the hand. So there's just a ton of advantages and it's, it's such a strong material. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the, the carbon torture, torture test videos that we did when we first came out with our carbon series in like 2011, you know, there was a lot of speculation because other manufacturers had tried, you know, making a carbon bow and they, and they hadn't been, been successful in doing that. So there was a lot of, you know, speculation on Hoyt's, uh, you know, ability to, to do it right. And we went out and we ran over them with trucks. We threw them out the back of a truck in the parking lot, ran them over, parked on top of them. You name it. I mean, big old redneck, you know, Hoyt Hunter trucks, <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a Ford Ranger or anything like that. So, um, and anyways, you know, in, the, in that same sequence, run the bow over, pick it up, slap the sight on it and shoot a bullseye. It's just, there's a gazillion advantages to it. And, and I'm by, I'm not an engineer by any means, but it's, it's far superior to aluminum. So, you know, our, our slogan is get serious, get Hoyt. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're making the most serious bows for the most serious bow hunter. So, you know, mass weight, whether you're into ultralight backpacking or you're going to be chasing sheep or whatever that is, you know, and I know Steve's 
he's an ounce counter. I, I look at his pack lists every year and see what he's toting around. But, you know, it's <laughs> if, you can, if you can shave a pound here or a pound there, at the end of the day, you're doing yourself a favor. Those long days on the mountains, you know, hiking the ridge, whatever it is, the lighter, more stable and strong that that platform is or that piece of equipment is, that's just adding to your advantage right you know there's so many variables on the mountain and anything that you can do to be a more effective predator you know as a bow hunter or a better shot in the field you know we're, we're trying to make people better archers and i think the carbon bows as far as hunting goes are far superior than anything else in the market yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think that's one thing that i i've always respected about hoyt um you know as you mentioned others had tried carbon and failed but if there's one thing that um I think of and know of with Hoyt is it that you guys are just trying something. It's that you're engineering something um, and you're putting, you know, a lot of design um, research and proof into a product, I think, before it ever reaches market. And I think the fact that you've been so successful with carbon where others haven't is just, you know, proof of that for sure. Yeah. I mean, and we don't put a market or a product in the market. If it you know doesn't work, we've got very, (laughs) <laughs> harsh testing conditions you know we dry fire our bows over 1500 times and at 80 pounds 30 inches of draw length you know we test those risers the limbs the camps everything goes we again we, we torture the crap out of it and if it doesn't work we're not putting it into the market so again i mean that's one thing that i'm, I'm not trying to brag but i'm going to at the same time we have the best team of engineers in the entire archery industry. I mean, they're just absolute studs. One, they're diehard bow hunters and and target archers, so they understand what a bow is supposed to feel like, how it's supposed to perform, but they just know the ins and outs, and we've just got such a kick-butt team over here that if it comes out, you bet it's going to be better than next year, and you can bet that it's going to be better than anything else. So, Yeah. Cool. That's good. That's covering a lot, I think, of the um, specs, if you will, for those of you that are bow shopping. I guess to wrap up, let's let's talk about a few more things. And this is, again, a little bit tougher, probably on a podcast, but these are some of the more intangibles, if you will. And going back to the beginning, you know, we had mentioned there about cams and on the Defiant, again, there's a difference between the, the regular Defiant and the Turbo Defiant. And part of that difference is the cam design. So, Really, when we talk about cam design, talk about cam geometry, um, that certainly affects the draw cycle, the power stroke of a bow. And then there's certain things related to that, certain verbiage that you'll hear thrown out there, such as um, volley and let off to begin with. So if you could, Matt, I know, you know, these days you're a recurve guy. You don't have the volley or the let off. <laughs> yeah, the further I pull it, the heavier it gets. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but for us who have training wheels on our bows, um, <laughs> let's talk about volley and let off. So can you kind of explain those for a lot of the guys who maybe heard those terms, read about those terms online, but don't fully understand them? Yeah. So let off is obviously whatever a company is marketing their or saying that their bow lets off a certain, a certain percentage at full draw. So most people need to understand at some point in time, if it's a 70 pound bow, yeah, you're going to be pulling 70 pounds back, but the let off and the design of the cam at some point, you know, our bows, we, we, we market and advertise them at, you know, a 75% let off. And so basically, you know, it's, you, you can go ahead and do the math, whatever your peak max weight is on that bow at full draw, it's going to be 75% less. So that's the amount of weight that you're going to be holding, which is obviously an advantage for, for hunting. Obviously, you don't have to hold 70 pounds, so you can be at full draw if the elk's behind a tree or for whitetails walking down the path, whatever that is. Um, so that's what let off is, is just a simple deduction of the mass weight at full draw. Um, the valley is basically, you know, a, tur- a turbo cam, I guess. You'll pe- hear people say, oh, that cam's aggressive, right? People are like, oh, man, that thing... It just wants to go when I'm at full draw. If I'm not pulling through that shot the entire time, if I relax at all, that bow wants to go. And that's kind of what that valley. So if you think and picture a valley, valley, there's obviously kind of a U shape or a slope in the middle. And that's the distance that you can kind of move before that bow wants to take off. Anybody that's been to ATA or is in a bow shop and you see somebody pick up a bow, 
you'll see them come to full draw and they'll slowly start to let down until they feel that cam want to go. And that's, that's what that valley's talking about. And I know Steve might be able to explain it a little bit better. Steve, do you want to kind of touch on that? No. Yeah. You hit it right on the head. It's, it's, uh, and the cam rolls over and you go into the let off portion of it. How, how big is that valley? And it's really, you know, it could be an eighth of an inch. It could be an one inch, uh, depending yeah. on the bow, uh, and <clears throat> just storing energy for a faster bow. Typically those cams are going to be more aggressive and designed with a shorter valley to, to get the most amount of energy as possible. Um, one personal thing is it is a great a long valley is nice um when you're just standing there at the archery range and you draw and you're like oh man i could hold this back forever uh i do think and you'll see a lot of target shooters don't shoot 80 plus percent let off because at that longer um when you have that much let off and you go to you know squeeze that trigger uh, there's just a you know a tiniest fraction of a second where the bow doesn't go off it's actually catching up through that valley or if you're right against the edge of the wall, it'll take off immediately. So I always try to be right in a low 70s, um, 72, 73%. Um, seems to be a good spot for me. Um, personal preference just from shooting a bunch. And you, yeah, that, that that's right. And you also have to look into, you know, there, there's laws against certain percentages of let off. Right. It's Colorado. I think it's over 80% or whatever. And it's not legal so it's <laughs> and some companies offer bows that have a higher let off so that's definitely something to look into you know fish and game those they're educated they know what to look at at equipment that's what their job is so that's another factor that plays into that <laughs> yeah i know that i don't know if they still do on the books but at, at one point even recently maybe they still do pope and young had um let off uh yeah. maximums mm -hmm. as well yeah yeah there's there's, there's a lot of a lot of restrictions there so depending on what you're doing and to to steve's point there's there's advantages to having higher percentage and there's not advantages and so um when people ask me what's the best feature of, of a hoyt bow or whatever and i'm not trying to sound sales pitchy but um you know we've kind of got the best of all worlds as far as the shooter experience you know the let off percentage the the way that bow feels so you know, realistically, you don't need to go higher than that. And if you can't hold that much weight, you probably shouldn't be drawing, you know, that heavy. peak weight. Yeah. That peak weight. Yep. Right. Yeah. Um, is the let off adjustable on your mainline hunting bows? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really not, um, you can, you can play with the timing of the cams and stuff like that to kind of create that. Some people will, long string it and then do different things. And I guess that's more of a, a technical side of things and, and for keeping things basic. No, yeah, for not for, <laughs> not for the average guy picking up the bow. Right. 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 You know, for, for your average Joe, that's going out there and looking, no, it's, it's not adjustable, but you know, any higher than 70% it, or 75%, excuse me, you know, you're not, it's that point of diminishing returns. So you're okay. really not gaining any advantages. So, yeah. Okay. So one other aspect, again, related to, um, I guess, the feel of the bow related to cam design and some of these more intangible aspects of selecting a bow, if you will, valley let off. And then a third, I think, that gets mentioned a lot is the wall. Again, very related to the two terms we just discussed. But um, again, describe the wall and then describe how um, I know even in, within Hoyt's line, there's different types of draw stops and how those might affect the wall of a bow. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I think that's one of the most people have kind of figured out that, you know, a solid wall is very beneficial. And the most important part to that, I think, for for your average Joe that's coming into it, something to keep in mind is you, you always pull through the shot. I mean, never really settle yeah you basically can settle but keep pulling through you know keep that tension keep pulling and when you have a solid back wall which is basically the feeling of that cam at full draw and um, you know sometimes and that and that's kind of felt through the cable tension Hoyt for example you know we've got a cable stop on both the top and the bottom cam and as they rotate around as soon as they hit those cables um, one of the great advantages to our new, you know, defiant series of bows and advantage to all that preload in the limb is that the cable tension is very high. And that's, that's a good thing. 
So when you come around to full draw, obviously as you're cycling through a bow, that cable tension is actually climbing. And um, when those cam stops, or excuse me, uh, cable stops come around and contact that, the tension is high enough that you can't, they call it sponginess, but basically you could get to the back wall and as it's touching it, you could pull it further than it's really intended to go. Yeah. And just factors back into that consistency statement that Steve made earlier. You know, it's having a consistent back wall and consistent shot sequence that's extremely important in tuning and shooting performance. So that's in a nutshell what, what the back wall is. It's just that feeling of that solid feeling at full draw and not being able to keep pulling past where it's supposed to be. Yeah. So it's basically, you know, again, limiting the rotation of the cams. Um, you know, when that cam is supposed to be at full draw and stop rotating, those stops, as you mentioned, a physical object pressing against, in the case of cable stops, the cables preventing yep. that from drawing, which in turn translates to the feel of the wall. Yes, I mean, if you're shooting a 30-inch draw, you shouldn't be able to pull the bow to 30 and a quarter or 30 and a half because the cam keeps rotating because you're pulling hard against it. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it should be dead nuts at, at what it's supposed to be and, and fit you perfectly. And, and like you touched on earlier, Mark, we, we actually introduced a, a limb stop for 2016 for our DFX cam that just really touches up <laughs> in a sense or, or solidifies that back wall um obviously the limb of a bow is is a solid object and so once that limb stop meets the cam you know along with being timed up and touching the cables you can, <laughs> you can't pull through it i mean i could hook up a, a chevy to the front of it and it, it it wouldn't pull through i mean it's rock <clears throat> and solid so for people that are definitely into that and in my opinion you know Honestly, I don't think you need it because of the way that these bows are designed. Um, the back wall is already super, super solid, but you know it, it's an extra feature and option for the guys out there that want to go do that. Yeah. Hmm. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I've always liked the solid back wall. Just, um, or I like holding against it and putting tension into it, but also, especially like if you're shooting in a crosswind, you can really kind of load up a little extra tension in there. Um, and just it, it seems to stabilize better for me versus like I switched from a single cam that I used to shoot a long time ago and it was it was just like you mentioned Matt you could probably pull an extra half an inch into it it's just very spongy back there yep. um, and once I switched to the Elite has their draw stops which contact the limbs um, it was very solid uh, and, and I don't know it's definitely my preference yeah I mean I think that feeling of having a solid wall as you mentioned I think hooking up a truck I mean that's what it feels like you could you could pull and pull and keep pulling and pull as hard as you can. You feel like you're going to rip the cam off the bow yep. before you get it to move. Yep. Um, and it, yeah, personally, I mean, I, I, I love that feel for sure. So Absolutely. I mean, that's, it, it just, it just helps with that consistency. And that's, that's the most important thing in archery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's wrap up with one thing. Again, this is kind of an aspect I think of, um, you know, bow selection, something that guys should be looking for when they're shopping for a bow. But again, it's hard to see on paper. It's hard to list a spec for it. And that's just the overall feel of the bow upon the shot, upon release, um, in terms of hand shock and things like that. So yeah. um, if you could talk a bit about that, Matt, maybe um, in terms of, um, you know, I guess in my opinion, let's back up. This has been one of the main differences that I've seen in the last, say, five years is how um, little shock uh, bows have these days. It's it's interesting, you know, the performance has gotten better, they're quieter, things like that, but in addition to this increased performance, increased energy, it's almost like they've become, you know, less of a feel for sure. And so maybe um, from the Hoyt perspective, what are, what are some of the factors that play into that dead-in-the-field hand that's designed into your products? One of the biggest things is obviously, and this is this is a carbon benefit, is the the damping property of carbon. And obviously, you know our, our aluminum series defiance shoot awesome as well. But um, something that Steve mentioned earlier about our cams, which is very important in the overall feel of the bow when being shot, is the amount of movement, you know, in the limbs is what I'm getting at. So, anytime there's an amount of movement when you shoot the bow 
that bow has to settle, right? Whether it's the limbs returning to their original position, whether it's the cams coming around and having to settle. Um, so obviously more preload in that limb when you draw one of the new bows back, um, that limb moves very, very little. And so when that bow is shot, it's all cam rotation because the stored energy is already there. You know, that, that performance is already built into it in that aspect. And that high cable tension, again, touching back on that, that settles the system really, really quickly. You know, if there's less tension in there, if the strings have to work more, you can see movement, whether you're watching, you know, high speed video or whatever. It's, it's one of those things that plays a definite role in that overall dead in hand feeling that people are talking about. So it's, it's the engineering and design of our bows. I mean, people can usually pick out a Hoyt bow in a crowd because of the, of the bridge that goes across the back of the grip on all of our bows. And what that does, one, it stabilizes the entire system and allows um, for the grip to, one, be thinner, which is going to fit your hand much better. But, you know, when, when the bow's settling, when the riser is, is helping contribute to that deadness in hand and, and dampening the vibration, that bridge is obviously absorbing some of that away from your hand. It's not all one center focal point coming back to the shooter. It's, it's being distributed throughout the entire riser, the limbs, the cams, and the cables. So um, there's a lot of advantages to that. And, and in a sense, you might not be able to, to feel that difference. But honestly, and, and I always say this to people, because every year, you know, marketing, it doesn't matter what company you work for, they, they come out and they're, oh, this is the latest and greatest. And, and realistically, these, these new bows are, it's one of those things you have to go and, and shoot apples to apples to be able to feel the difference. I mean, take your, take your 2014 bow or 2015 bow or whatever it is, and you shoot it against a new 2016 bow, and I guarantee you'll feel the difference. <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. So anything else, Steve, specifically that you're looking at when you are evaluating a new bow purchase or figuring out what your setup's going to be? Um, yeah, yeah. like I said, first thing, I'm looking for 33, 34 axle to axle, 7 inch brace height. That's just personal experience. Um, my suggestion and, and, you know, frankly, there's a lot of great bows on the market, Hoyt being right there at the top of the list. Um, go shoot them. And it all comes down to, <laughs> yeah, it all comes down to um, confidence. And that's, I think, something that I, I used to get really hung up on when I was talking about earlier is getting all the speed out of my bow and you know, just trying to get as much performance out of it. And I was so concerned about what arrow and what veins and stuff like that. And, and I did so much testing that really the differences were so minor on the tech side. And it's fun. And and uh, it's just fun to be techy and geeky about that stuff. But really, it comes down to your confidence. So find a bow that, that you feel confident shooting, that fits you well, Mark, like you talked about, that the anchor points naturally line up with you, one that fits your specs as far as draw length and, and how much can you comfortably shoot. Um, you know, uh, going on a tangent here, but I always tell people, like, don't – if you're trying to figure out how much poundage you can shoot, sit your butt on the ground and draw your bow sitting on the ground. Um, cause guy, cause any guy can stand up and pull 80 pounds, you know, at the range. Um, so that, that's another thing to take into consideration. Um, yeah. and you know, I, I guess that's, that to me, it all comes down to confidence and practice and shooting well. And, uh, and that translates to being in the field to being more confident and, and you kill more animals. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's the name yeah. of the game. That's, that's how I look at it. Yeah. All right, Matt. So to wrap up, um, what didn't we cover that you want to cover, whether that's a new uh, product, new technology, new feature of Hoyt bows? I mean, just kind of give you the the open door here to talk about anything that you feel might be good for those uh, shopping that we didn't cover. Well, shoot. You know, I think we kind of covered the basics, but <clears throat> like Steve said, you, you got to go down and you got to shoot the bows. You can... You can go online and you can get on Archery Talk and listen to you know what every keyboard ninja out there has to say about how they're a pro and know everything. But the the proofs in the pudding is how I put it, and it's all about being confident with your equipment. You know, go down to your local shop, check it out, try it out. If it's comfortable and it's right for you, no matter what it is, you know, I I always say I see people on social media, you know, 
bashing this or that. It's like, you know, Chevy, Ford, and Dodge, right? Everyone's kind of got their own opinions. But um, in, in the hunting world and basically in general, you know, a- animals deserve our respect. You know, it, I think if you're taking a shot at an animal, you better know that you can make that shot. It better not be a guess. You better be confident in your shot. You better be confident in your equipment. And those animals deserve that. You know, I'm a big advocate for that, that, you know, don't go out there bombing arrows at 130 yards or whatever, you know, (laughs) but just go out and be confident with your equipment, whatever that bow is. And that's the bottom line as, as a hunter that I would recommend to people. So get out and try them. That's, that's all I can say. Awesome. Well, thanks a bunch, Matt, for your time. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's a wrap. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening. Hope you have a great holiday season. Happy New Year. We will be having some awesome episodes coming up soon, including more on the archery side of things, as well as some new gear from the ATA show, some fitness and nutrition advice, all kinds of great stuff coming up. So hope you stay tuned. As always, consider leaving us a review in iTunes or Stitcher, wherever you're listening to this, and send us your questions or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com.